Well, good morning, everyone, or wherever you are, good afternoon. I'm Father Chris Alar here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, and it is an honor to be with you and a special welcome to some groups that are with us today, especially the virtual conference of the Healthcare Professionals for Divine Mercy with Marie Romignano. Uh, we welcome all of you who will be watching this, I believe, maybe a little bit later, some of you right now live. Uh, we are live here at 11 o'clock in uh, Massachusetts. And welcome to the Holy Face Ministry out of Buffalo, New York. We're going to be talking as well about your wonderful work. So we're grateful that all of you could be here. You know, it's a beautiful day around most of the country. And so we always notice the numbers, live numbers plummet when it's a beautiful day. That's okay, because throughout the day, these, this video will remain up so you can always view it. So anyway, this is a beautiful gift to have uh, an opportunity opportunity to speak with you. In fact, this is my 27th and Brother Mark's 27th consecutive Saturday that we've been bringing to you these Explaining the Faith series. And I'm going to show on the screen, this is part, as Brother Mark will show you, this talk is part of that Explaining the Faith series that you could get. I've released the first 13 of the 27 talks. The next will be coming, but you can get those on, uh, by calling our 800 number, 800 460 6274426 or by visiting uh, the divine mercy.org slash uh, explaining the faith and that will give you a chance to live stream it or if you want to buy it on DVD and get it it's on shopmercy.com or .org I am sorry so thank you so much so you know this series uh, I was only planning on doing a dozen or so but we've gotten great feedback we're going to continue it going and right now we've reached almost three million uh, people between Facebook and YouTube. So thank you to all of you. However, with that, with the God's grace of getting that message out there, the evil one always is going to attack. And I want to make a quick announcement. Um, the evil one has attacked us. Somebody has created an account with my name. If you receive a comment through YouTube or Facebook, with a picture of me in a yellow and blue vestment, a uh, close-up picture, with the name Father Chris Alar. It is not authentic, and they are asking for money for Nigeria. Um, we support our foreign missions, but this is one that is definitely a scam and unauthorized. So please, if you get one of those, report them, turn them in, say you spoke, or Father Chris told you directly, this is a scam, please report it, um, and do not donate to this, please. So we will never ask for money or donations over comments, over the web, over YouTube, Facebook, things like that. So thank you for your understanding on that as well. So anyway, today, as you saw on the screen, we're going to talk about the incredibly important topic. Um, I can't emphasize this enough of end of life, the end of life guidelines that the church gives us. I'm going to give you church teaching and care for the sick and dying. And so this end of life guidelines given by the church is something we all need to know because sooner or later, if not our loved ones, but regarding ourselves, we will all face these decisions what is allowed in church teaching, what is not. So the cure of the sick and dying is extremely important. So now I want you to get a pen because I'm going to give you some real good resource information throughout this talk. So please grab a pen if you don't have one. I think you'll want to follow along. But let us now begin with a prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask you send the Holy Spirit down upon us during this time of teaching and learning and open our hearts to know the will of you, Almighty Father, when it comes to end-of-life issues, caring for the sick and loved ones, what we are to do when we are faced with ourselves or someone we care about being ill. We ask especially for graces for them at the moments of their struggles. And we ask, Heavenly Father, that you give us the Blessed Virgin Mary and Jesus, your mother, to be able to be with us and those we care about at their bedside or at least spiritually in prayer, to give them that consolation and mercy 
needed for their salvation. And we ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, God bless all of you again. So, as I said, this is such an important topic. And being part of the healthcare professional conference that you can find on uh, the divinemercy.org slash virtual healthcare, you'll find other great talks. Uh, Father Seraphim, Father Kaz, uh, Dr. Sobix, and others. So anyway, my topic here is talking about what happens for the sick and the dying, how we care for them, and what we decide to do at the end of their life. Now, the end of our life is obviously one of the hardest parts of our walk through um, on earth, of our, our life here on earth, but it is actually the most blessed. This is ironic, isn't it? You know, Jesus, we all know this, went um, you know, to his death and rose again. He conquered death, as we say in the mass, so we have hope. You know, if the cross was all there was, there would be, you know, we would despair. But since obviously the resurrection gives us that hope of a new beginning, we have to understand it is not necessarily a time to despair. This is why the mystics tell us at funerals, um, all the tears that we shed, they're good. I mean, we're going to be sorrowful and miss them. But the, the mystics tell us, please, what's way more important than the tears are the prayers. And because sometimes they're attacked at that moment of death by the evil demons and the spirits. That's the time. In my book that J Brother Jason and I wrote, there was a story we told about the death of someone who took their own life. And the demons were, were dancing around, giving high fives, ready to take this soul. And thank God that soul, through the prayers of others, the prayers of the mother of that young man, invoke God's mercy and Jesus came in at the last moment as these demons were ready to devour the soul and his mercy enraptured and, and embraced that young man. And you, you, you can just see how good the mercy is if we for our loved ones or they themselves turn to God's mercy. That's what this talk is all about. <clears throat> you know, G.K. Chesterton said, Christianity has died many times and risen again for it had a God who knew the way out of the grave. Are we not in that position today? We are facing this again. It seems like Christianity is disappearing. It's dying, but it's going to rise again. And you and I are part of that. This whole healthcare conference is part of that. The Holy Face Ministry in Buffalo is part of that. And we're going to talk about the importance here. So the church gives us special gifts for us at the end of life, most especially in her sacraments and in prayerful devotions that she can help teach and guide us what to do and guide us, us in making those end of life decisions for ourselves and others. Now, <clears throat> what I'm going to give you today is very important because most of us don't study Catholic Church teaching from the bishops like the USCCB. Let's look at our next slide. What I'm going to give you here is from the USCCB, the Conference of Catholic Bishops and Church Teaching of Documents and whatnot. But I'm going to try to make it easy for you to understand. Now, the truth is this. The bishops here in the U.S. has said, the truth that life is a precious gift from God has profound implications for the question of stewardship over human life. I think this is pretty straightforward. We are not owners of our lives and hence do not have absolute power over life. Okay, we get that. That's pretty straightforward. Um, you know, that's why we say in the church teaches that abortion is intrinsically evil because we don't have the authority over that life. Only God does. The mother doesn't own the life of the child. She's a steward right? The father too. And um, it's the same thing with your soul. I mean, people talk about selling their soul to the devil. You can't sell your soul to the devil. You don't own it. God does. I mean, you can worship Satan, kind of idiotic to me, but you can't, you can't sell it. You don't own it. God owns it. What you can do is show your devotion. And this is why we need to turn to God. Now, 
The USCCB says we have a duty to preserve our life and to use it for the glory of God. Okay, so right there they say, you and I have a duty to preserve our life. But here's what's interesting. But the duty to preserve life is not absolute. Wow, that's kind of surprising, isn't it? Quote, for we may reject life-prolonging procedures that are insufficiently beneficial or excessively burdensome. And this is what we're going to help you to, to discern today. How do you tell when life has to be preserved and when it's extra, extraordinary or burdensome or insufficiently beneficial that you don't have to do extreme measures? That's a very delicate line. We're talking life and death here. And this is what we're talking about. An example is suicide and euthanasia. These can never be morally acceptable. So um, the USCCB, I'm reading here from the Ethical and Religious Directives for Catholic Health Care Services. Anyway, summarizing all this for you, there are basically two crucial things to consider. Again, you might think, well, this is obvious, Father, but wait till we get into it. The two critical things are care of the body and care of the soul. The problem with secular medicine, when we rely just on secular medicine, they are focused only on the body, not the soul. We're humans, we're both, body, soul, composite. But they consider mostly if only the body. My mom, God bless her, I love her to death, but to her, the doctor is God. He says anything, she'll do it. The problem is these doctors aren't always based on the faith. Now, great doctors like Dr. Sobix are, but many we have to be careful because they're not based it on the soul as well as the body. And here's where we begin. Let's start with the body, the care of the body. Let's look at our next slide up here. Here's a picture I, I wanted to throw in. This is my very special friend, Sister Tom. She is a Vietnamese nun that I went to Holy Apostles with seminary. She was up here for, with me in seminary for a couple years. Just an absolute beautiful soul. There she is with her father. Um, she went back to Vietnam and her father was dying. Now, the sad thing is in Vietnam is the boy, the oldest boy is supposed to take care of the father or the parents when they, they're elderly and sick. The problem is her brother died of an illness. And so the mother, Sister Tom's mother, the poor thing was left without a husband or a son and basically destitute. And so you see their Sister Tom praying with her father who then passed away. But this is the kind of loving care we're talking about. Incredible love being at the bedside. And we're going to talk about some of the ministries that do that. All right. We have an obligation to give people at the end of their life ordinary care that is needed to survive and to live. Now, let me emphasize that word ordinary because we're going to come back to that. Father Tad Pocholsik, who is the National Catholic Bioethics Center director, said, quote, ordinary interventions. What does that mean, ordinary? They can be understood as those medicines, operations, and treatments that offer a reasonable hope of benefit for the patient and that can be used without excessive pain, expense, or burden. All right, so in other words, these are the things that are strictly obligatory to preserve life and health, like food and water. All right, now, food and water is a good example. Even if they have to be given artificially. Back to the example of be careful in secular medicine. I was down in North Carolina and I had a prayer ministry of taking Rocky, my big yellow lab, God bless them in North Carolina. They didn't have all these crazy rules that we have in Massachusetts. I'd never be able to take Rocky to a nursing home, but I had my yellow lab and I would take him into the nursing home and visit people. And one day I walked in in the room of a, a man who was one of our parishioners at our parish and his wife was just crying unconsolably. And I said, Janice, what's wrong? 
And she said that they told her that they had to remove the feeding tubes from her husband. He was doing quite well. The feeding tubes, yeah, he needed to get food and water uh, with the help of these feeding tubes. But that was just ordinary means, even though they had artificial instruments to do it. Um, they were ordinary means, food and water. So this man was basically starving to death and being dehydrated. So I'm like, I, I was just, I wasn't a priest yet. I was like, I don't think that's right. So I went back to the priest and the priest says, they can't do that. This was a Catholic nursing home. My goodness. And the doctors were, I think it was even hospice, told her that they needed to take the feeding tubes out. My priest, God bless him, went roaring over there. We went back there. They put the feeding tubes in. He lived another year and a half, a very happy life. This is crazy. We got to be careful because people think this beautiful woman thought that was church teaching. That if the doctor, Father, or uh, Chris, if the doctor said that it should be taken, it should be taken out. No, not necessarily. Maybe. I'm not saying don't listen to the doctor. I'm saying that we have to weigh it with church teaching. All right. The Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith in 2007 said that administering water and food, even through tubes, does not impose a heavy burden either on the patient or his or her relatives. This wasn't placing a burden on the wife. She didn't want to see her husband die just yet. They had some good times afterwards. It is not, nor is it meant to be, a treatment that cures the patient. It's just ordinary care for the preservation of life. So something like this is not allowed by the Catholic Church. Now, it could be the same for a ventilator. Now, there's a lot of people with coronavirus now on ventilators. So this is very important. What's the church teaching here? All right. It's the same for a ventilator or other assistance for breathing. A ventilator can be used as ordinary care if it's believed that there's a considerable hope of recovery. And with coronavirus, many people recover. All right. Also, it does not have much difficulty or burden on the family. Expenses and whatnot, sometimes insurance company covers it, where there's been donated ventilators. These are ordinary treatments. However, let's look at the next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot our feeding tube slide. Here's a slide that uh, is an example of the feeding tubes. Um, you could see it looks, see the feeding tubes up there? It looks like this is some kind of life support system. But I want to show that to actually show you, although it looks artificial, it is artificial. This is totally allowed by the church in order to keep someone from dying when they could still be living a good life. All right, now, let's go to this ventilator. Before I put up the next slide, this ventilator is something that could be ordinary. But now let's look at the slide. It also could be extraordinary. There are all kinds of different ventilators. Look at those pictures up there. Everything from the simple to the complex. All right, a ventilator could be extraordinary, extraordinary. What does that mean? Well, if someone on a ventilator, let's say after suffering several strokes, all right, serious strokes that they cannot breathe on their own, are in a hard condition that will only worsen causing inevitably their death from the stroke and very burdensome. In those cases, continued ventilation would or could be considered extraordinary and could be disconnected, even though that would bring the death on much sooner, even within hours or minutes. Now, such an act of withdrawing the ventilator would not be an act of euthanasia or killing. Why? Because they would be dying due to the underlying condition. That's what would be causing the death. It may be burdensome to continue this ventilation on them or the family. So remember, the church teaches super 
Human heroics are not required, especially when death is imminent. So extraordinary means are not an absolute requirement. You have the choice. And some people choose not to, like going through extreme chemotherapy and what it does to the body. Some people have the right not to go through that. It's not suicide, that's not euthanasia. So for instance, a ventilator then, you could have both examples. You could have an ordinary basic oxygen or you could have the extraordinary, like an iron lung, which would not be mandatory. The basic ordinary would be required to keep. All right, let's talk a little bit more about extraordinary care. Now, let's read our next slide. What does the USCCB say? This is important. We are obliged to use ordinary care to preserve life and health, but we are not obligated to provide extraordinary care that does not provide a reasonable hope of benefit without imposing excessive risks and burdens on the patient or excessive expense to family or community. And I am kind of surprised that they talk about expense there. Um, I wouldn't have thought they would have brought off expense because there's no value put on human life, it's infinitely valuable. But the church realizes that a situation that somebody who is naturally dying wouldn't be in a position to completely bankrupt the entire family for two extra days of life. That's what the church is referring to there. You know, even food and water, this is surprising, I mentioned food and water being ordinary, Means, which we have to keep, do you know food and water can also be extraordinary means. For an example, when somebody can't digest it, they get to a point where their sickness has progressed so bad that they cannot digest food or water, then food and water would actually become extraordinary. And the person would be allowed the natural death in those cases. So this is why it's so important that we understand what does the church teach. All right. The well-being of the whole person must be taken into account. Every case is different here in deciding the use, for instance, of technology. Now, the church says these therapeutic procedures that are likely to cause harm, there are some examples, or undesirable side effects, can be justified only when there is a benefit greater to the person. Again, I use the example of chemotherapy. Sometimes the benefit will save the person's life. Other times, it'll only extend it by a few days or weeks, and the ravaging that it does to that person, the church does not ask them to go through that. So I hope this makes sense. We are not required to pursue every possible medical option available. We're not. If it, the burden outweighs the lengthening of life and the benefit, they can morally forego certain treatments. Again, we gotta be careful here because you cannot ever allow a euthanasia or assisted suicide, and I'll get more into those. Pius XII said, quote, you can use extraordinary means. Now, I guess this is a good point. Father, what if I wanna try these, these medical options? What if I wanna try everyone available? What if I want to use extraordinary means? What if I want to give it a shot? Absolutely. You have that right. This is your right. And so this is important. This extraordinary means, this is what Pius XII said. He says, you can use extraordinary means to save someone, but you aren't morally obligated to do so. So remember, if they want it, we need to accommodate them and their request as much as possible, but they don't have to if they choose not to. So don't give anybody a feeling of guilt if they choose not to do it or if they choose to do it. Don't make somebody feel guilty that they choose extraordinary care because you think they're burdening the family and don't give somebody guilt if they choose not to because you think that they're taking their life. Very important. Okay, it's kind of like virtue. Do you know we are required to have ordinary virtue in this life? We need it to be saved, 
but we are not required to have to have superhuman, extraordinary virtue. That's the canonized saints. Now, if you all make it to be a canonized saint, God bless you. But the odds are most of us aren't going to get that. We're not going to get that superhuman, extraordinary virtue. But we still have to hope that we have the ordinary. That's what the Lord is telling us. All right. Let's go to specific examples. What about the case where you are incapacitated? All right. You are unconscious. Let's talk about this. To make sure that you are cared for according to proper church teaching, it is important that you appoint a health care proxy. Marie Romagnano was mine for a while when I was going through my pulmonary embolisms and coronary artery disease, uh, neuron um, uh, issues in my head. I was going through kidney stones. I was going through non-benign polyps in my colon. What a mess. Praise God, I'm getting through it. But you need a health care proxy in case something happens, in case you are incapacitated and unable to make decisions. Here's why. The health care professional, or sorry, proxy, should know your wishes if you want that extraordinary care or not, which is your choice. And if so, what level? You know, basically, I would, I would tell Marie, Marie, maybe give me one shot on the extraordinary level, and that's it. If I don't make it past that, let me go home to the Lord. Maybe I might say, you know what? I still feel maybe young enough, strong enough. Let's give it a shot. Let's go all the way. Let's try every chance we can on the extraordinary. Maybe we don't try it at all, but that extraordinary, we have the choice. Now, execute a power of attorney for health care, but not a living will. This is very, I feel very important because the church even says this. I'm not giving you legal advice here. The church actually says this. You should execute a power of attorney for health care, but not a living will. Because then it's literally giving life or death decisions and that making decision power to an unknown physician. If you have a living will, you're literally giving life and death decisions and power making decisions to an unknown physician. So you should get a power of attorney for health care that you trust and that knows your desires, not some unknown physician. All right. Now, what does Vatican II say is not allowed? We talked about the ordinary that's allowed. What is not allowed? All right, Vatican II condemned, okay, what is anything opposed to life itself, like euthanasia or willful destruction. What is that? Assisted suicide, for example. However, we have to keep in mind that sometimes in the church there's something called the principle of double effect. A lot of times people say, Father, what about a mother who's pregnant with a child and the baby, either the baby or the mother is going to die. Either they have to have the procedure that's going to save the baby or save the mother. What do they do? Well, we turn to the principle of double effect. That principle in Catholic Church teaching of Thomas Aquinas says that you are allowed to make a choice that may have a detrimental or devastating consequence as long as that was not your intent. So if the choice is made to save the mother's life and the baby dies, she has not committed a mortal sin because it was not her intent to kill the baby. And so the choice to save her life has to be a greater good or as great a good than the effect that could happen. Now, many mothers have chosen to save the baby and let herself die. Is she committing suicide? No, because that was not her intent. It was the effect that medically there was no other way out. Only one life was going to survive. And so she has not committed suicide. This is a horrible position to be in. But both ways, with the principle of double effect, show us that there was not an intent in either case to kill either the mother or the child. And the benefit of saving one of the lives was a huge benefit. So we, we have to look at that. Now, what though is not allowed? All right, what is not allowed? We'll start with this one. Next slide. Euthanasia. Can you believe this is an actual ad 
This is an actual medical advertisement. Are you kidding me? Euthanasia. Sometimes death ends suffering and not life. Another encouraging, end your suffering. This is crazy. This is basically telling people to take their own life. So euthanasia, why is it against church teaching? It's the intentional killing of a person, often for the stated purposes of ending, ending suffering. And I'm sorry, when I said taking their own life, that's not correct. That's assisted suicide. Euthanasia is the doctor or the family taking the life of someone. That's why the church says it's, it's, it's homicide. You know, people say, well, Father, they were suffering. This may seem compassionate, but really, it's not. People have said, Father, it's mercy. There's no such thing as mercy killing. Okay, there's no such thing. There's nothing merciful about it. Basically, you are saying your suffering is pointless. You're a burden to us, so this is better for everyone. Even if you don't state the words, that's what the actions portray. So John Paul II said, quote, what really happens in this case is that the individual is overcome and crushed by a death deprived of any meaning or hope. There's no meaning to my suffering. We need to end it. I'm just a burden on my family. We'll talk more about this. And then, and then it goes on, it is used to eliminate often malformed babies, severely handicapped, the disabled, the elderly, especially when they are not self-sufficient or terminally ill. So this is where I knew somebody very close to me where their pregnancy was a, a deformity, but the doctor said, abort, abort. God bless this poor woman. She just did what the doctor said. She didn't want to end that baby's life. But the doctor said, it's so deformed, you're going to have to abort. So she did. That's the doctors making the decisions of God. We have to be very careful that we educate on church teaching before those decisions are made. So these can be gifts. Even though the person might be born with handicaps, they can be gifts. You know, you may have heard me say, and I've said this before, I think the most incredible people in this world are the parents of special needs children. Their patience, their love is unbelievable. You know, our faith teaches that God will never give you more than you can carry I think the reason that every special needs child has a parent that they do speaks volumes of the parent. A parent that has been given that, ch that, that, that challenge to, to raise a special needs children, God bless you. I'll never forget one day I was celebrating mass right here at the shrine and I was in the back ready to process up the aisle and there was a woman, the shrine was packed. And there was a woman in the front pew with her son and he was just uncontrollably screaming and foaming at the mouth and spitting and yelling. And I started praying thinking, Lord, how am I gonna do this mass? And I prayed and I came forward and we did, we began the mass and all of a sudden instantly he calmed down, he was quiet, he was peaceful. And then soon as the mass ended, he went right back to foiling and throwing his arms and screaming. And God bless that mom. She just held on to him with such love. And so now I was outside waiting for everybody to come out. I was looking for her and I said, thank you for coming, that was an amazing he was so good through the whole mass. What grace. And she said, Father, I've been here many times before. I had never seen her. And she said, when he comes here and he goes to mass, he sees angels. And that's why he's totally calm the entire liturgy. She just was like, she was just like this matter of fact. I was blown away. And she says, Father, he sees angels, the entire mass. 
and he's so calm and he's so peaceful. And then at the end of the mass, sometimes we have a few difficulties. I'm just like, God bless you. What a gift. I really believe that God, these are what's called handicapped and, and deformed. I believe these are the people that have special connections to God that we don't even know about. I believe that those people we label as useless or deformed or handicapped and we treat them like, like burdens on society are actually the closest ones to God and the ones bringing and showering more grace and mercy on this world than anyone else, maybe than other than a cloistered nun. This is phenomenal. And so we don't necessarily just say, end those lives. You know, Mother Teresa used to say, the feeling of unwantedness, especially from those who are supposed to love and care for us, is the worst threat to our personal human dignity. So euthanasia, or another of, I should say, another human being, is never morally permissible. Never. That's why we call it part of the non-negotiables. If, if you heard some of our homilies here before the election, up until the election, which is now passed, we made it clear that the church teaches that it's not about our personal opinion when we go to the voting booth, but we have to vote for those candidates that must uphold what we call the non-negotiables of Catholic church teaching. And they are the protection of human life from conception to natural death. So that's why euthanasia is included in there. The sanctity of marriage and the preservation of religious liberty. So in this, euthanasia violates that non-negotiable, the dignity of human life and the protection of life. Yes, we Catholics are not only about abortion, that is preeminent, but euthanasia and taking a life is very, very grave. So we must be careful in not acting prematurely to end a life. Why? Sometimes a person may not look like they're acknowledging anything. They may even look to be, I'm sorry to say it, but, but what we call brain dead. They may not be able to move or respond to things, words or stimuli, but they're very aware of what's going on. We hear stories of this, that people have come back from comatose states and knew exactly everything that was going on around them. Could you imagine being in a coma? One guy I read, this was years ago, was in a coma for 14 years. And he remembered and heard everything. Could you imagine being trapped like that? How difficult that must be? And he overheard the conversations of his family and the doctors talking about euthanizing him. I can't even imagine. He, he said he, he was trying to scream. He was trying to, trying to let them know, move his hands, yell, I'm here, I'm here. But he couldn't. So we don't know the state of the body. God is the owner of life, and he may allow sometimes this suffering for their salvation. So we don't want to interfere with God. Only he has that decision. You know what's happening when people are suffering is the, the evil one, the devil, is trying to trick them into giving up the redemptive value of their sufferings. Because he's trying to say, give it up. It's worthless. It's pointless. Give up this value of your sufferings, which can be very powerful. It can be united to the cross of Christ, not only for their own salvation, but for your salvation as a family member or a loved one. This is very powerful. The faith during extreme times of the sick person is so powerful, it can move mountains and save souls. Do you know, my, one of my favorite passages in the whole Bible, the four men and the paralytic, when they lowered the sick man down to the feet of Jesus through the roof, Jesus didn't look at the sick man and say, your faith has healed you. He looked at the four men and he said, your faith, their faith has healed this man. That's how powerful faith is. Now it can be the opposite. It can be the sick man looking up and saving the four men. You, if you're the sick person, or maybe your loved, loved one who is sick, if they have an extraordinary act of faith, 
remaining faithful to God in the most extreme suffering, that faith is enough to not only save their soul, but maybe yours. Don't cut that off. Very powerful. Their faith is very needed for the salvation of themselves and maybe you too. This suffering that they're enduring, I'm not saying, oh, well, Father, you're making light of it. I'll get to that in a minute. But our suffering in this world is just a blip in the bigger picture of reality and eternity. It just, it, it's it just a speck of time, a dot, where salvation and eternal life is forever. We don't want to interfere with that. Let's look at our next slide. This is where I think it's very powerful. John Paul said, this is John Paul II, each man in his suffering can also become a shearer in the redemptive suffering of Christ. Wow. This shows the value of suffering united with the cross of Christ. I do a whole other talk you can find on our YouTube channel, Divine Mercy, and it's called, um, Why Would a Good and Loving God Allow Suffering? This is part of the reason. I talk about that whole thing in that talk. Why would God allow it? All right. That's another topic and another talk, but it's because we, we can offer that suffering united to Christ for the salvation of ourselves and our loved ones. You know, show those that you love who are in nursing homes that united with Jesus, they can save souls. I, I go to these nursing homes and I see these poor people who've been abandoned. And, 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 and a couple times they've asked me, Father, what's church teaching on assisted suicide? And I always get worried. I'm like, Millie, why are you asking me that? Well, Father, I'm a burden. I'm a burden to my family. They don't even come visit her. They just have to pay the bills. She's just a burden. She says, I'm a burden on the, on the staff. I'm like, Millie, I grab her hand. I'm like, my goodness, do you realize that your suffering has more power than an atomic bomb? It can actually do more than you've ever imagined. Give them a prayer. Go to their bedside. Be with them. Show them that their suffering has purpose. The Holy Face Ministry in Buffalo, New York, which I'm going to talk about in a minute here, is a great example of that. And we're going to tell you how you can actually be part of it, even if you're physically in a different location. We live in this utilitarian society that we must realize or think or believe the falsehood that people are only useful if they're contributing physically. This is not true. By offering up their sufferings, they're contributing immensely. Diary 1804 said, angels, this diary of St. Faustina, angels, if they were capable of envy, would only envy man for two things. One, that we can receive Holy Communion, and two, that we can suffer. Whoa. So legalizing euthanasia or assisted suicide shows that a radical autonomy is greater in value in our society than human life. Crazy. All right, let's go to assisted suicide. I, I want to show you a slide in a minute. But before I do, what's the difference between assisted suicide and euthanasia? Euthanasia is taking the person's life, someone else. Assisted suicide is enabling a person to take their own life. Again, it's done with the intent to supposedly end suffering. But again, there's no such thing as mercy killing, okay? So the rates right now of euthanasia and assisted suicide are soaring around the world. It's this culture of death. But as the church says, legality doesn't always mean morality. Well, Father, it's legal. We can do it. No, so is abortion. Abortion is legal, but it's not moral. All right. In some parts of Europe, do you know that any age, children can receive physician-assisted suicide. This is insane. Do you know how many kids are depressed because they're maybe being picked on or whatnot? These kids are too young to make an informed decision such as their own life. If they say, you know what, I don't want to be bullied anymore. I'm going, and that's why bullying is bad, but I want to have my life ended. In some of these nations in Europe, they can go and have their life taken. 
in, incredible, insane. Let's look at it. It's coming this way. This is why the dangers of socialism have to be so warned about. Now let's look at our next slide. The legal status of assisted suicide has changed in states from a crime to medical treatment. Look at these states. Ironically, the blue is the blue. But we see Washington, Oregon, California, Colorado, Maine, New Jersey, Washington, D.C., and others. The lighter blue is Montana, which means it's under legislation right now. It's coming. It's coming. It used to just be none. Then it was just Oregon. Now it's more and more. It's coming. We have to be aware of this. We should certainly seek relief from pain, from suffering. I'm not saying we shouldn't. We're not masochists or sadists or whatever they're called. We don't want more suffering. We shouldn't be praying, God, bring on me and make me suffer because I want more and more. No, we should be like Jesus in the garden. Lord, take this away. But not my will be done, your will be done. So we should seek relief from pain through palliative care, hospice, and other licit means. God is not calling you just to suffer. But he can bring a greater good out of it. We can't just simply say that a life free from suffering and pain is inevitable and we have to avoid at all costs to the, even the point of taking someone's life. No. It may be necessary in atonement for their sins or our sins. Not saying we should want it or ask for it or try to get rid of it. Yes, but only licitly in ways that are allowed by the church. All right. What about this next one? Organ donation. This is an interesting one. Is organ donation allowed by the church? Okay, so here's an example of just an organ donor card. Are you an organ donor? Is that allowed by the church? Yes, it is allowed. But very carefully, we can't allow euthanasia to get someone's organs. It's allowed by the church, but only as long as the harvesting of the organs is not done prematurely or hastens the death of the person, even causing the death. That's what's going on in China right now. The black market for organs, they're murdering people even. And especially euthanasia, the, the elderly that are sick, oh, oh, Lord, have mercy. They're being harvested like crazy. What about cremation? Is cremation allowed? Yes, by the church because of financial reasons, but only if the ashes are interred in blessed ground or a mausoleum. We Marians have been talking about putting a, a mausoleum here, a crematorium here, excuse me, an opportunity here for um, people to, to have their loved ones brought with their ashes. It is allowed, but you cannot spread the ashes. You know, my father, God bless him, Marine from Vietnam, his dream is he wants to have his ashes, he wants to be cremated and have his ashes mixed with gunpowder and then to be shot in a 21-gun salute by the Marine Corps. <laughs> I said, Dad, as long as your son's a priest, no way. It isn't going to happen. All right. All of this is care for the body. Sorry I took so long, but now we're going to get into the important stuff, even more important. Body is critically important, but now we're going to get into care of the soul. Let's look at our next slide. St. Augustine. What did St. Augustine say? St. Augustine said, take care of your body as if you were going to live forever and take care of your soul as if you were going to die tomorrow. Whoa. That's a powerful statement, isn't it? We have an obligation to make sure people have the spiritual care they need as well as the physical when they're approaching death. We need to make sure that the dying have access to a priest if possible and the sacraments. People forget this. They're all worried about the funeral home and the plot on the ground and that's important. But don't forget the spiritual. The USCCB, all right, I'm gonna read now from the Ethical and Religious Directives for Catholic Healthcare Services 
they give us help. I'm gonna go through a couple things that you may not have known that I didn't even know until I really researched this last full week on this project and this talk. So even as a priest, listen, because you might be able to help your priest. There are things here I guarantee you priests don't know. I didn't even know some of these things that I'm about to share with you. Let's start with the next slide, anointing of the sick. Now, normally this is done when a sick person is fully conscious, okay? Now, it may be used for those, however, who have lost consciousness or the, loose, the use of their reason, if there is reason to believe that they would have wanted this sacrament of anointing while they were still healthy. Now, anointing is powerful. It actually forgives sins. Listen to this even if the person is unable to make a confession. Now, it's true, mostly it's a preparation for death, but not only is it that. It's not only for those who will die, but it's also for healing of the body especially, but yes, even psychological, if great depression or anxiety is causing people into the danger of taking their life, for example. All right? It is meant to be both a possible source of healing physically and spiritual strengthening in preparation for death, but not just death. That's why when I go to the hospital and people see a collar walking in with the last, they call it the last rites, they're thinking, oh my gosh, they're telling me I'm going to die. Get this priest out of here. No, it's also a sacrament of healing, prayer, strengthening. Strengthening the spirit. It can also be given if there is just a chance of death. Like if you're perfectly healthy, but you got to go under full anesthesia for an operation, you can get anointed. Even if the person is unconscious, I as a priest can give them absolution for their sins. In fact, a priest can give conditional anointing even at the accident scene where he doesn't even know who the person is. I was in California. We were leaving a conference late one night at 10 o'clock, and we were the first car on the scene of a motorcycle accident. And, 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 and the, 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 God bless him, he was killed right there on the road, still laying on the road. I'm trying to get to the body to anoint it. And the police just swarmed in and just basically threatened to put me in jail forever. If I got any closer, I couldn't do the physical anointing. But you betcha I would have if I could have. I didn't even know who that man was, or if he was Catholic or not Catholic, a believer or not. We do it conditionally. We do it conditionally. Now, in those cases, this is what the priest has the ability to do. All right, a priest can give that conditional. Now, a baptized non-Catholic can receive anointing, but if you know the person, now in the case of the accident, I didn't know, but if you know the person is not baptized, you should first have them baptized. And that wipes out all sin and punishment as well. So if you can get them baptized, this is important. Get them first baptized. Now, this anointing is called the sacrament of anointing. It's different from when you go to a healing mass and 150 people get in line and the priest comes up and makes a sign of the cross with the oil on you. You go around and the next person comes up. That's just a blessing. That is not the sacramental of anointing and many priests don't know this. People say, well, Father, um, oh no, uh, you were anointed. I gave you an anointing. That's not sacramental anointing. That's a blessing. The word anoint means to bless. So you need a sacramental anointing, but you, anybody just can't get it. You just can't go to the priest and say, Father, I want the sacrament of anointing, you know, because I'm a little frustrated with my daughter and it's really getting me stressed. No, that's not what it's for. Okay, so the blessing of a healing mass, that can be used for that purpose. Now, that's anointing. What about viaticum? 
What is viaticum? That is just last receiving of the Eucharist, your last time receiving the Eucharist. All Catholics are capable of receiving communion should receive viaticum. If you're capable of receiving communion, you should receive viaticum. In the danger, especially if you're in the danger of death, while you still have full capacity, if possible. Viaticum is the Eucharist given at the end of life. We call it food for the journey. It's preparing us to meet God. Now let's go to our next slide, emergency baptism. Look at this slide here. This is a very interesting slide. Did you know that any lay person can baptize someone who is in danger of death? It is called an emergency baptism. So if you arrive at the scene of an accident and you don't have any idea who this person is, you're not a priest to do the anointing, baptize them. You actually have that power according to the church. If you show up and somebody's dying and you have no idea who they are, where they're from, if they believe or not believe, you can conditionally baptize if you have water with you. Now there's a question I asked and I'm getting different answers and I'm not sure your priest might know. Spittle. In one document I read, it said if there's no water available, you can use spittle. Another document I read said you cannot. So this is why I carry a bottle of water. Carry a bottle of water in your car. You're never going to know when you have that accident right in front of you and somebody's lying dying in the road that you can go and actually baptize them. Let's keep reading this slide. Let's put it back up. If there are no Catholic clerics nearby, that means priests, Anyone, even a non-Christian or someone who doesn't believe in God can baptize as long as they meet certain conditions. What are those conditions? The baptizer must have the intention to do what the church requires. Second, uses the correct formula of words. What is that? I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It is not in the Redeemer or the Creator, the Redeemer and the Sanctifier. It's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it performs the, uh, and performs the correct action of pouring water over the person. All right, very important now. So this is really, really important. So this emergency baptism can be used by anybody. Do you know newly born infants, if they're in danger of dying, you can baptize. Miscarriages, Little babies, they can be baptized, even if they've miscarried, baptized, okay? It should be baptized if possible. In the case of emergency, if a priest or deacon is not available, you can. As I said, be at the scene of the accident, whatever. You know, it normally requires the permission of a parent to baptize a child. If a child's healthy, People think I need permission from both parents. No, you don't. You only need permission from one parent. But in the case of a death, a near death, you don't even need that. You can baptize that baby. All right, what about confirmation? Emergency confirmation near death. When a Catholic has been baptized but not yet confirmed, so maybe you know someone, family member, and they're in danger of death, any priest can confirm that person, not just a bishop, any priest, all right? What about um, other things? There's so many others, I'm gonna have to skip these because I'm running out of time. All right, let's go into the apostolic pardon. I'm gonna show you a couple slides on this before I go too much farther, but before I do, this is one of the most powerful things you can possibly have. <clears throat> and it can be given by any priest. What is the apostolic pardon? It is a plenary indulgence, basically, which removes not only all the sin, because that happens in the confessional, but all the punishment. Like when you disobey your parents and you were a child, they forgave you, but you still had loving discipline punishment. You were grounded and your allowance was stopped. So this punishment with the plenary indulgence is also forgiven in addition to the sin. So if a Catholic, so what is a plenary indulgence? It's a remission of the temporal punishment due to the sins already forgiven. So a Catholic that has had a regular habit of prayer throughout their life 
at the end of their life can receive not only absolution, but the apostolic pardon. And if they do, the church teaches they go straight to heaven. That's powerful. Now, what I want to point out about the apostolic pardon is something I talked with Father Kaz about. There are actually two forms of it. Your priest probably doesn't know this. I didn't. But get your priest, if you have a loved one that's getting the apostolic pardon, to say both of these. The one talks about removing sin, and the other one talks about removing punishment. We want both. Let's read the first one. Apostolic pardon one. This is from a priest. By the authority which the apostolic see has given me, I grant you a full pardon and the remission of all your sins in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. That's incredibly powerful. All their sins are forgiven even if they can't make a physical confession. But I want to keep going as a priest and tell your priest as well. Let's look at our next slide. This is the second apostolic pardon. The second apostolic pardon, do we have it on our screen? Through the holy mysteries of our redemption, that's the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus, may Almighty God release you from all punishments in this life and in the life to come. May he be open to you, may he open to you the gates of paradise and welcome you to everlasting joy. Wow. So talk to your priest. Make sure the apostolic pardon talks about sins and punishment. Should, you know, you should have anointing before you get the apostolic pardon so that you're in a state of grace. Because remember, the pardon relieves the punishment. But in this case, there is a prayer that also relieves the sin. So what we have to do is make sure we can get them to confession if possible, if not, at least to anointing, and if not, then the apostolic pardon. But that's important because they should be in a state of grace. Doesn't work if they're not in a state of grace. But if the priest cannot be present, the church, Holy Mother Church, grants such persons who are properly disposed this plenary indulgence to be obtained at the nearness of death, provided that they regularly prayed in some way during their lifetime. I'm reading right from church teaching. Use a crucifix or a cross to hold in their hand to show their faith, and that is what is recommended to obtain this plenary indulgence. In such a situation, the three usual conditions required to gain a plenary indulgence are supplied by the church, are substituted by the condition that they provided that they regularly prayed in some way. What this means is the receiving of Holy Communion, the going to confession, and the praying for the intentions of the Holy Father, the church has got you covered. Because if you're unconscious and you can't do that, the church is saying, we'll supply for you. Now, if you're conscious and can, you need to do that. But if you can't, the church is saying you can still get this grace. This is amazing. In such a situation, this is where the church calls ecclesia suple, the church provides. So if a priest is not available, what's the next best thing? If you are conscious and a priest is not available, make an act of contrition from your heart telling God that you're sorry and a spiritual act of communion saying, Lord, I can't receive you physically in the re, uh, Holy Communion, but give me the graces if I just did. Now, the next thing that you should do is to pray the Divine Mercy Chaplet and the Rosary for the dying. Now, this is something Jesus gave directly to St. Faustina. Let's listen to his words on our next slide from the diary 1777. Pray as much as you can for the dying. For your entreaties obtain for them trust in my mercy because they have most need of trust and have it the least. Be assured that the grace of eternal salvation for certain souls in their final moment depends on your prayer. 
Are you kidding? Jesus is saying that the salvation of souls depends on your prayer. And one of the greatest prayers you can do is the chaplet. The chaplet of divine mercy. How do we know that? Jesus' own words. Here's what Jesus said about the chaplet of divine mercy. If you don't know how to pray it, you can find it online. Just Google chaplet of divine mercy. Here's what it says. Whoever, he told this to St. Faustina, whoever will receive, recite the chaplet will receive great mercy at the hour of death. This is from Diary 687. When they say this chaplet in the presence of the dying, I will stand between my father and the dying person, not as the just judge, but as the merciful savior. Diary 1541. Priests will recommend it to sinners as their last hope of salvation. You're looking at one priest right here that absolutely does that. This is your last hope of salvation. Even if there were a sinner most hardened, if he were to recite this chaplet even once, he would receive great grace for my infinite mercy. I desire to grant unimaginable graces to the souls who trust in my mercy. Amazing. Jesus told St. Faustina in 880 of the diary, oh, how incomprehensible, St. Faustina said, is God's mercy that the Lord allows me by my unworthy prayer to come to the aid of the dying. I try to be at the side of every dying person whenever I can. All right. I want to tell you about a special ministry. I get a lot of requests to talk about ministries and to promote different groups, and I just can't. There's just too many. But one group that I've got to promote and I invite all of you to be a part of is called the Holy Face Ministry in Buffalo, New York, upstate New York. This group is a group that's been praying the chaplet of divine mercy at the bedside of the dying when they, since they began. Now, Faustina, though, was sick, and she said, sometimes I can't get to the bedside, Father. Maybe you too. Maybe you say, I can't leave my house. I'm sick or, or whatnot. You can do what Faustina did. She actually spiritually placed herself at the bedside of the dying people. And she prayed for them spiritually at the bedside. Now, if you are physically able to get to the bedside of the sick and the dying, that's beautiful. Pray the chaplet for them. But if you physically can't, you can unite with a group like the Holy Face Ministry in Buffalo, New York, who I want to tell you about. They pray this chaplet at the bedside. Let's look at our first slide of them. Here's just a picture of the wonderful people part of this ministry, of the Holy Face of Jesus that goes to the bedside. There is their mother house. Look at that beautiful image of divine mercy, right? Isn't that incredible, all a lit and a glow? And these are some of the beautiful members of this ministry. You know what? Even if you're not in the Buffalo area, you can become what they call an adorer of the holy face. What does that mean? That you can unite with them. This is why I say get your pen because I'm going to show you a video. It's a real short clip, just a minute and a half, that shows you what they do and how you can help and aid the dying and the, at the bedside of the dying, even if you're not physically there, by being in a door with the Holy Face Ministry. Let's watch this quick video that's only, um, well, actually, you know what? There's a picture up there. Show the cross first, Brother Mark. Let's, before we show the video, look at this cross there. Contemplate his face. Isn't that beautiful? That's what an adorer does. A door contemplates the face of Jesus. And through that adoration, this is their cross in their, in their beautiful mother house. You can do this by becoming an adorer of the holy face. Let's watch this quick video and get a pen because if you want to be part of something special, I can't support this group enough for the great work that they do. There's no fee, there's no charge, but watch what they do. From the time we get the prayer request, um, because many times we may go to the bedside to pray and not here at the Mother of Mercy House. And then we have our prayer lines. So we get all of our intentions that come through our prayer line that continue to get pr every, our everyday prayers. And I think when people come here, we see the face of Christ in them. Absolutely. And they see the face of Christ in us. Um, and it's such a beautiful thing. Oh my God. 
a, a person suffering or a person who's sick or someone who's dying, I may need them at my bedside someday. We, the disciples of the Divine Mercy in the Holy Face of Jesus, would like to extend an invitation to all of you, to any of you who would like to come visit us for prayer, for reflection, for discernment, but also to consider inquiring into the ministry. We would love to have new members. We're a growing community. If you just want to pray and be part of a community that prays together, works together, laughs together, we invite you to come and see what we're all about. Now that is a special group that I know well. Uh, personally, I can give you my word. I've, I've worked with them, I've done ministry with them. We're gonna be doing a conference together next year in Buffalo. We're excited about that. We're gonna have some great speakers. Last year we had Teresa Tamio set up and Stephen Ray and myself, even Scott Hahn was uh, tentatively set, but it all got canceled. We're gonna try it again next year. But this is a special group. Let me put back on the screen, if Brother Mark can, if that pen, if you want to learn more information, how you could be part of this, even from if you don't live in the Buffalo area, if you do, that's even better. But if you don't, you can go to holyfaceministry.com and contact them that to, well, I should say, learn more about them or to email info at holyfaceministry.com. They'll send you some free information or you can call their office at 716 716- 662-6025. A beautiful ministry, one I highly recommend because they are there at the sick and the dying. Now, their focus is heavily on praying the chaplet, but they also pray the rosary. The rosary is the other. There's many promises made by God, by Jesus to us for the rosary. We cannot, here's what's interesting about the rosary. Do you know what once a great saint said? You cannot pray the rosary and remain in mortal sin. One of them is going to stop. Either you will remain in mortal sin and you will stop praying the rosary, or you will remain praying the rosary and stop committing mortal sin. The two cannot exist together. Wow. Pick the rosary. That's a powerful, powerful gift. You need this because the only way your soul is lost is to die in an unrepentant state of mortal sin. And if you're praying the rosary, eventually you're going to leave mortal sin. And that's going to save you. So why these two prayers? These two prayers are an extension of the Mass. The rosary is a, not just a bunch of Hail Marys, it's a meditation on Scripture like the first part of the Mass, the Liturgy of the Word. It's, lit it's a meditation on Scripture. The Chaplet of Divine Mercy is a sacrifice. Eternal Father, I offer you the body, blood, soul, and divinity. It's a sacrifice. And what's the second part of the Mass? Liturgy of the Eucharist. The priest offers sacrifice. But Father, I'm not a priest. Yes, you are. By virtue of your baptism, you share in the offices of Christ, priest, prophet, and king. This is powerful. And also, if you listen to Father Seraphim's talk during this healthcare conference that we're all being a part of, amazing, because Father Seraphim actually talks that one of the main reasons Jesus gave us the chaplet of divine mercy was to stop abortion. He said that was given to Faustina when the angel was ready to strike at Warsaw for the sin, according to Blessed Michael Sapochko, her confessor, of abortion. This is really one of the big reasons the chaplet was given to mankind. That's why we got to keep praying it. So both the chaplet and the rosary have extraordinary promises and a lot of graces. Don't miss it. All right, start praying them now, not only for the salvation of the sick and dying, but your own salvation. Now, where does all this get us? Why do I bring this up? Let's go to our next slide. 
Jesus commands us to the works of mercy. And this is the work of mercy that I'm going to finish with called comfort the sick. What do I do, Father? You talked about all the church teachings and, and regulations and rules. They're not rules. They're, they're guides. But Father, give me, tell me what I do. How do I comfort them? Well, we're here on the last page, the last part of the talk, to give you the most important. This is the comforting of the sick, which is a work of mercy, a corporal deed of mercy. Now, I'm going to show you on two slides a list of things the USCCB tells us that we can do to care for our loved ones at the end of their life. Now, I'm going to have Brother Mark show the first slide, and I'm going to talk about each one, so maybe you can put it in the corner. The USCCB guidelines, and we're going to have 10 of them here, of what you do for a sick loved one to comfort them to meet the needs of the deeds of mercy, the works of mercy. All right, first, invite God in. This is clear. Pope Francis stated that praying in difficult situations is opening the door to God, and he will only come in doors that you open. Remember that painting of Jesus knocking on the door? If that's your house or your heart, he's not coming in unless you answer. So the first thing you need to do is pray that Jesus come in, open the door of your heart and your sick loved one's heart. That dying process is a sacred time. It's a final chance to seek closure in this life and to prepare them in the next life for hope that there will be a resurrection. As you enter into this time with them, you must ask God to accompany both of you. God doesn't go where he's not invited. So number one, invite God in. Number two, listen and learn. Well, that's obvious, Father. Is it? Listen to this. No pun intended. Try to discover your loved one's values and how to best honor their wishes. This is going to require empathy. It obviously can be hard because you're going to assume that you know best for them and they want the same thing you do if they, you were in the same situation. Not true. Not always true. Listen with a non-judgmental ear. Okay? Non-judgmental ear. So that your loved one feels that they can speak to you freely, not afraid. But remember, as much as you want to agree with their teaching, or excuse me, their desires, you can't go against church teaching. If they ask to be put to death, you can't agree. That is against church teaching. We can't do that. We have to remember, if they ask something that is contrary, like my dad asking to have his ashes shot in a 21-gun salute, sorry, Dad, can't do it. All right, number three, inform yourself. Here, the church teaches to have unconditional respect for their human dignity, okay, with first of all respecting their life and what they've done. Be aware that a person's wishes, sometimes for refusing treatment, even ordinary treatment, basic treatment, and wanting to maybe be put to death, like assisted suicide, usually come from fear of dependency, helplessness, or pain. So in order to comfort the sick, what do you do? You may not even think about this. You may not even think that I need to make them sure that they know that they're not a burden. I don't need to tell them that. Yes, you do. You need to let them know they're not a burden. Emphasize it, that it's an honor for you to help them. They're not a burden to me. They're giving me a great chance to be charitable. Do you realize that their sickness and the effort it requires from you may be your salvation because of all your acts of charity that it's going to require? Incredible. All right? Next, be steadfast in compassion, number four. Compassion doesn't mean just taking suffering away. What does the word compassion mean? It means to suffer with, not to take it away necessarily. Be patient. They're going to demand things. Recognize these as part of the natural process, but surround them obviously with love and support and companionship. You know that. 
The patient's suffering can be alleviated by your attitude towards it, as well as how care, the good of care you give them, either by yourself or if you can't, hospice or whatever medical professions. Do not leave them abandoned, please, in nursing homes. One of the things that breaks, breaks my heart is when I go to these assisted living centers and the staff tells me, Father, would you be able to go visit um, this person over there? Their family hasn't been here in three years. And I'm talking even before coronavirus. That breaks my heart. They have no, nothing to hold on to. All right, next, number five, reminisce. Think of other small little comforts that you can provide to get their memories thinking, like special photos, bring in pictures or mementos. Do not feel guilty about laughing. I know that I felt guilty with someone's I love that I felt were laughing when they're getting sick or they're dying. We can't do that. We need the Catholic guilt. <laughs> no. All right, next, number six. Let's go to the next slide. Help them achieve closure. Help them define any unfinished business, personal project, financial concerns, unresolved relationships, other matters that occupy their mind. Put them to rest. In fact, if you sit with them and work with them, creating and helping them to make a list of this undefined business and how it can be finished, they will feel and discover a sense of purpose and they'll be at more peace. Next, provide opportunity for resolution. Don't be afraid, this is your last chance. Tell them I love you, or I'm sorry, or I forgive you, or just simply thank you for raising me. Those words can be hard if there was pain, but they can promote a much needed healing for that person during their dying process because then it gives reconciliation. If you're reconciliated to them, unforgiveness is one of the most serious sins we could ever commit. It is, it is so serious it can cause our salvation. So simply by you opening the door and beginning the dialogue with a thank you or I love you or I'm sorry or I forgive you may cause them to then reconcile and forgive, saving themselves and you. Invite a priest to hear their confession or give them anointing or viaticum. These are all ways, these all of which can heal the soul and prepare them to meet God. All right, next, provide a peaceful presence. All right, there comes a time, obviously, naturally, that what people are gonna to wanna to withdraw from their surroundings the dying persons may lose interest, um, activities they used to like, they don't like anymore, they don't do. But that's why your own patient presence can provide them support. How do I mean? They say that hearing becomes very acute at death. It's the last of the senses to fail. They're very acute in hearing. So playing their favorite music, reading a book to them, uh, praying together, or just simply being with them and letting them listen to the sounds of the children or the house can be very soothing for them. And then finally show, or two more, show physical tenderness. The power of the human touch. Now again, all of these are from the USCCB. Ask if you might be able to brush their loved one's hair or apply lotion to their hands or feet or simply hold their hand. I know in Corona, the time of coronavirus now, you, there might be fear but this is your loved one. Tell stories, laugh, and share memories. You know, letting them know, as I said, not that they're a burden, but you love them being there with them. And then lastly, bear their transition patiently. All right? The time right before death is going to bring a lot of changes emotionally, physically, spiritually. So be patient. Now, here's the key. Allow the how and when about death to be God's decision, not yours. Ask God for that wisdom, the church tells us, to know the final words to say to them, if any words at all. As you are able, give your loved one permission to make the transition. Now, you might say to them, I love you. It's okay, mom. You can go now to the arms of Jesus. 
This is good, but do not appear anxious or that you're pushing them to die. That can be trauma for them. Remember, God may be allowing their suffering for their redemption or yours. This is powerful stuff. And finally, I can't talk much about it because I've run out of time, but praying for those who have died long ago. Let's look at our next slide. Here's praying for soldiers that have died. Even though someone has died, you know, Father, we need to pray for them they're in purgatory. I tell you, you can also pray for them to help them at their judgment because God is outside of time. There's no past for God. There's no future for God. I know it sounds crazy, but God is so omniscient. He knows everything. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He can take your prayers, even from today, and allow those graces to be showered on your loved ones, even at the moment of their judgment. There's a documented story of Padre Pio, who was being evaluated by his doctor. And the doctor noticed he was praying, and the doctor said, what are you praying for? And Padre Pio said, the death, happy death and conversion, or I should say the conversion, and happy death of my grandfather. And the doctor said, well, I knew your grandfather. He died 20 years ago. And Padre Pio said, I know. But God knew 20 years ago that I'd be making this prayer tonight. And he can apply those graces from this prayer to my grandfather to give him a happy death and conversion. Now, that doesn't mean we can change the past or we can pray World War II never happened. No, God knows that was his permissive will that happened. You can't change that. But we can pray that those who died in World War II, you're giving them the grace from your prayers, even from now, to help them at the moment of their judgment and maybe salvation. Incredible. All I'll say about this is in the next slide. This is all in my book. Please consider going to suicideandhope.com to be able to get this. After suicide, there's hope for them and you. You can memorialize your loved ones. We pray for them every day, have masses said for them. This is a powerful, powerful concept. It, it's not just for suicide, it's for any kind of suffering or death that you need to go through. Remember, as a lady that helped and our, contributed to our book said, Sammy Wood, you can never get over it, a true tough loss, but you can get through it with the grace of God. So anyway, everybody, with that being said, God bless you. And before I give the final blessing, I want to give you some resources. Where can you go? If you are in a position of having to make tough medical decisions for a loved one and you're not sure you need an ethical advice, call our next slide, the National Catholic Bioethics Center. There, the NCBC answers. There's no charge, any questions that you have to better understand Catholic moral teaching and to be able to give specific issues the attention that they need in healthcare and other life issues. So all consultations are strictly confidential. You can call that number there, 215-877-2660, or visit their website, ncbcenter.org slash ask a question with hyphenation. Now, I want to say thank you. On our next slide, to all of you who have joined us from the Healthcare Conference of the Healthcare Professionals of Divine Mercy, Marie Romagnano, God bless her. She's an RN that's dedicated her life to bringing God's divine mercy to the world, to her patients, to those who are seeking God. And she's been tirelessly working to put this conference together for you. The conference is today, November 6th and 7th. I think today's November 6th. I can't even remember, it's so crazy. So this is a beautiful opportunity for us as today Today the 7th, I can't even remember. Today's the 7th of, of November. My goodness, this is what you get with two hours of sleep. So today, and, or yesterday and today are the conferences, but you can view them all the way up to November 16th. And so you can go there, look at your screen. You can see this is the virtual Divine Mercy Healthcare. You can still register and you can watch these conferences for credit if you're a healthcare professional all the way to November 16th. Even if you're not a healthcare professional, you can still watch, tune in for these beautiful talks by myself and others, Father uh, uh, Seraphim, Father Kaz, beautiful, beautiful talks. But she teaches you how to care for patients using divine mercy. Don't forget the Holy Face Ministry. They are awesome. And my last slide, 
you'll all be happy. <laughs> Visit shopmercy.org or call 413-298-7426 and get two incredibly powerful booklets. The first booklet is from the Healthcare Professionals of Divine Mercy, and this booklet is Nursing with the Hands of Jesus. You can get that one on your left, or from the Holy Face Ministry and Kathy Walbeck, you can get At the Bedside of the Sick and Dying. You can get both of these booklets on shopmercy.org or calling that 800 number. So everybody, this is such an incredibly important topic. Again, I'm sorry, I always go longer than I want to, but you've been great. The healthcare conference is such important work. Healthcare professionals at Divine Mercy do do great things. The Holy Face Ministry in Buffalo, New York, please give them a call, send them an email, find out how you can be an adorer with no cost, just join them, that you can be at the bedside spiritually with all these people they minister to and be part of that fabulous ministry. I can speak about both of these two because Kathy Walbeck and Marie Romagnano are personally very inspirations to me. And so I can speak for what they do and what their groups do, join them as they will help you to live the corporal works of mercy, especially comforting the sick and dying. Because you and your loved ones and me, we're all gonna be there someday. So thank you for joining us and may almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Why be a Marian helper? Because we, Marian Fathers, celebrate a Mass for you and all our members each and every day. You can share in all the prayers, good works, and merits of all the Marian priests and brothers around the world. And now you can share the graces just as if you were a Marian priest or brother. Every All Souls Day, we see a Mass for all the deceased members of the Association of Marian Helpers. Again, there's no way that after we die, we can help ourselves. but. We have to rely on the prayers of those here on earth. And we members of the Marian Fathers will be praying for you as a deceased member of our association. You can share in the graces of the perpetual novena to the divine mercy. Remember Jesus told St. Faustina that the chaplet of divine mercy is one of the most powerful prayers we can make. And every day here at the shrine of divine mercy, we pray it and you can share in those graces. So if you have any questions or you wanna learn more how to be a Marian helper, please visit micprayers.com or call 1-800-462-7426 and let me personally pray for you and your loved ones. Thank you and may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.